Hello, good evening everybody and welcome to this evening's Geography for Schools uh, lecture. Uh, you join us tonight to hear a live question and answer session with Professor Ian Candy, who, as you will know, gave a lecture last Monday on the subject of drylands in uh, a changing world. And it was a great lecture that covered lots of different material and we've had questions that have already uh, arrived with us this week. Uh, hopefully, now this is all a little bit experimental, so I know that uh, you're a kind audience and that you'll forgive any technical mishaps. Uh, you're a kind audience and, and hopefully you can see Ian there, who's in our microscope lab uh, in the Department of Geography at Royal Holloway. And uh, I'm Dr. Alistair Pinkerton, who will be uh, hosting this evening's uh, Q&A. Uh, Ian, do you want to maybe just give a, a very quick recap of some of the highlights of your talk last week before we get into questions? Yeah, sure. What a great idea, Ralph. So thanks, everybody, for joining tonight. Um, I thought I would um, situate myself here in the microscope lab at Royal Holloway. This is one of our research labs, because effectively a lot of the time when we're doing work on past drylands, it's actually my microscopic work we quite often using, looking at um, lake sediments, looking at pollen content, diatom content, these microscopic fossils which tell us about the nature of the water bodies. So yeah, so last week um, I covered a few things really. I talked about what drylands were, so talked about this idea of an aridity index, the balance between precipitation and evapotranspiration, and the idea that drylands are actually on a, on a scale, so we go from hyperarid through arid, semi-arid, content, diatom content, these dry, microscopic so fossils which tell us about, about the nature of the water bodies. Regions which are classified as drylands in those criteria cover about 40% of the Earth's continental surface, so we're dealing with a really important region of the world, and 35% of the Earth's population is living under dry conditions. Um, we talked about why we get drylands, where they, where they occur, so we talked about the role of ocean currents, we talked about the role of mountains, we talked about the role of continentality, and we also talked about the role of major atmospheric circulation systems. Um, we talked about why drylands change over time, this idea that 20,000 years ago deserts were more expanded, they contracted and many of the world's deserts became lush, verdant grasslands, around about 10,000 to 8,000 years ago, and then this trend towards drier conditions, which has occurred over the last 8,000, 6,000 years. And then the final point we made was most climate models in the future predict that drylands will expand, desert regions will become more extensive. That's because these atmospheric zones, which control the position of things like the Sahara, are set to expand. They're set to expand towards poles, and that means that regions like the Mediterranean will become drier, and many parts of southern Europe will become more like semi-deserts. And that's effectively the content of last week's lecture. Fantastic. Ian, that was a brilliant summary. Thank you. And, oh, and over the past week, and in fact during last week's lecture, we did receive a number of questions. And I will also just be monitoring the, the chat on the live Facebook feed as well, just to see whether any further questions come in. But um, I think we should probably just get straight on with it and, and ask the questions that have that, that have come in. So the first question I have is from uh, is from Andy, and he was asking an important question. Uh, I'll kind of slightly pressy your question, uh, Andrew, uh, Andy, if you're here. Uh, how do changes in the Earth's orbit control climate change, and what is happening to the Earth's orbit now? That's a slightly boiled down version of Andy's question. Ian, over to yeah, you. That's, that's great. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, Al. So, so last week I made the point that if you think about the last twenty thousand years of uh, the Earth's history. 20,000 years ago was the last glacial maximum, the time when ice sheets in the world were more expanded than they are in the present day, and that was the time when deserts expanded the most. And then you go through a period about 10,000, 8,000 years ago when those deserts become wetter, they become more humid, and then a trend towards drying. And I basically said that the main driver of that was changes in the Earth's orbit. And um, effectively, what I said was that a number of factors change in terms of the Earth's orbit. So we talked about this idea that the Earth's orbit goes from near circular to more like an ellipse, and that happens over 100,000 year timescales, and also the tilt of the Earth's axis change. So I have quite handily here 
a globe. And so basically, what I mean by that is if this is the tilt of the Earth's axis, sometimes the axis is, is more vertical, sometimes it's more oblique. And then that, that occurs on 40,000 year time scales. And then there's also the Earth over time spins around like this. This is called precession, and that happens on 20,000 year cycles. Now, all of those factors are operating at the same time, so they're varying at the same time. And really, it's not so much what's happening to the shape of the Earth's orbit or the tilt of the Earth's axis, but how they're all operating together. And what I thought I would just start off by talking about was why do we get glaciations? Because the reasons why deserts are more expanded 20,000 years ago is because we're in an ice age. And that does three things. It, firstly, it locks up a lot of atmospheric moisture in ice sheets. And that means that rather than being in the atmosphere and being precipitation and rainfall, it's locked up, so that's not accessible. The colder Earth means you've got colder sea surface temperatures, so less evaporation. Colder air holds less moisture. So an ice age world is a drier world. So, so really, if we're thinking about how the orbits, changes in the Earth's orbit produce expanded deserts, we need to think about why the changes in the Earth's orbit um, produce ice ages. And the crucial thing is the changes in the way the Earth's orbit work, in terms of ice ages, we are the, the area where ice sheets grow from is effectively about 65 degrees north. Okay, That's effectively where, in an ice age, most of the world's ice sheets grow from. So we're talking about Scandinavia, and we're talking about the high latitude, this is North America here. And the way that changes in the Earth's orbit work to control whether you've got an ice age or not is summer temperature. Because what dictates whether an ice sheet grow is the temperature in the summer. Now, uh, my colleague Alistair here is from Scotland. And you might think to yourself, Al, well, why are there no glaciers in the highlands of Scotland? Because every year, every winter, we get tons of snow and people go skiing. Well, the answer is very simple. Although the winters are very harsh, in Scotland, the summers are so warm, you might not believe that the summers are so warm out, but the summers are so <laughs> warm that all of that snow melts. So all the snow that falls in the winter is gone by the following winter. Okay. And for an ice age to form, you need the summer to stay season after season so the snow builds up into an ice sheet. So what is important, what controls how the Earth's orbit controls ice ages is summer energy coming in from the sun at 65 degrees north. Okay, And effectively, what triggers an ice age is when the northern hemisphere summer is tilted furthest away from the sun. So if you have a situation where the Earth's orbit is an ellipse, it means that in one part of the year, the Earth is a long way away from the sun. So that produces an ice age. And if you tilt the Earth's, ax the, the Earth's uh, ax axis steeply enough, and if this is the configuration, so this is the equator, this is the North Pole. If the Earth is a long way away from the Sun and the, Earth is, the Earth's orbit is more elliptical, when this is the state of the axis, you're getting minimal radiation in the Northern Hemisphere. And that means that effectively your Northern Hemisphere summer is really cold and that produces ice ages. Okay, And that triggers what uh, the expansion of deserts. So it's a combination of the shape of the Earth's orbit and the tilt of the Earth's axis and when Northern Hemisphere summer is furthest away from the sun. Now actually, the conditions which produce the opposite, the interglacials, are basically when the Earth is closest to um, the sun and the Northern Hemisphere is tilted towards the sun during summer, that means you're getting maximum energy in that means you've got the least amount of ice development, and that means you get really warm conditions. And that's what basically produces what we call an interglacial, the really warm period between glacials, 
and that's what produces wet conditions in desert. So actually, the shape of the Earth's orbit, you're most likely to get coldest and warmest conditions when the Earth is elliptical, orbit, more like an oval, but effectively, it's where the Earth's summer is and the degree of tilt. Now, the important thing that is um, you know, relevant here, the second part of Andy's question, is actually the changes in the Earth's orbit, which have occurred over the last 8,000 years, have led to a gradual reduction in the energy that the Northern Hemisphere is getting at the crucial latitude of 65 degrees north. And one of the reasons that the deserts have expanded again from 8,000 years ago is you're moving more to a situation where the Northern Hemisphere is cooler, that changes the gradients across the hemisphere, and it means that the deserts become wetter. Now, also what that means is, is that if the energy from the sun in the Northern Hemisphere is declining because of changes in the Earth's orbit, technically, we should be moving more towards a new ice age. And there are many researchers So Ian, if I'm allowed a follow-up, I mean, that's a pretty scary prospect. So in theory, the, the, the different tilts on the Earth's axis should be, axis should be kind of compensating, if nothing, if nothing else, for... Uh, Ian, thank you. I'm sorry, I was just reading a comment on the Facebook page. Uh, somebody was asking if the, uh, that it, he's saying it's gone very quiet. It could be because I plugged my headphones in. That could be a, the problem. So I'm just going to take those out and hopefully the audio will recover. It could be that I haven't quite got the audio settings set up correctly. Um, but we know it was working before. So I'll, I'll just uh, go back to this method. Uh, thank you, Sam, for your for your feedback. Hopefully this will now work. Um, that we've covered that issue quite, quite quite comprehensively, I think. Yeah, it's a complicated topic, and also I'm not totally aware about how much of that is covered at A level. So that's why I went into it in a bit of detail. Perfect, thank you. Uh, let's move on. In fact, the second question is from Sam, who has who has kindly let us know about our audio problems. So, Sam, thank you for your question this week as well. Um, and again, I'm just going to slightly paraphrase the question for for Ian. 
Uh, so Ian, last week you talked about drylands as barriers to migration in the deep past. Do those barriers explain, Sam asks, the restricted interaction between different societies? For example, um, restricted interaction between Europe and Asia in the historical past. Quite a, quite a complex question. Yeah, it was, it was a really interesting question. Thanks very much, Sam. So, so one of the things I was talking about in my, in my presentation last week was this idea that in the deep past, and we're talking about what we refer to as the Paleolithic or the Stone Age, so the Paleolithic ends about 10,000 years ago. And Between Europe and Asia. About the dispersal of humans out of Africa. And Homo sapiens, our species, probably evolved about 200,000 years ago. And to go from East Africa, where most Homo sapiens seem to have evolved from, and to get out into Asia and also into Europe, they need to have crossed the Sahara Desert and they need to have crossed the Arabian Desert and the deserts of the Middle East. And so the idea is, is that the, the periods of time driven by changes in the Earth's orbit when the deserts contract and they become wet and verdant and support freshwater bodies and animal life, humans can migrate across. So we know in the past that these have been major barriers. Now, Sam's point was that does do those barriers affect society going forward in time into, into more historical time? And it's an interesting, it's an interesting point. Um, and I'm not totally sure I can give you an absolute answer to this, but there's something quite useful to think about here is that early humans, so Paleolithic humans, were hunter-gatherers. Effectively, they didn't farm anything. Um, they didn't have livestock. They basically hunted animals and gathered stuff from the landscape. That means in that phase of human history, we were incredibly sensitive to climatic fluctuations. Okay, Because effectively, if in somewhere like the Sahara, the Sahara dried up, there was no fresh water, there were no animals, humans had to leave, humans had to abandon that region. In the same way that, for example, Britain, the deep time Stone Age archaeological record of Britain is every time you get a glaciation, humans are forced out because you can't support the animal life that humans need to hunt and to eat. Now, the interesting point is, is that as we start to develop more agriculture, yes, our lifestyle is controlled by the climate because you only need a few bad years of weather and your, your harvests are problematic. But as we develop, as we develop settlements and civilizations, we also develop social networks. Okay? So you might think about those Paleolithic tribes living in the desert is a small tribe which had limited interaction with other people. Therefore, their ability to survive in harsh landscapes is entirely related to what that tribe can do. But when you start to get settlements and civilizations, yes, harvests might be affected by climate, but actually, because they have networks and trade with other groups of other people, they can survive harsh climatic conditions because of that social interaction. So it's, yes, major geographical barriers existed, such as deserts, which acted as problematic areas to cross in the historical period, but because of people's ability to interact and trade and share resources and share knowledge, actually they probably would have been less of a barrier. So actually working out how much of a role climate played in historical development is much more, is much more difficult because it could simply be that, say like the Chinese civilizations and European civilizations were just so far apart that there was no interaction. It might not have been the barrier at all. But and one of the things which, when you start to move into periods of time when you're dealing with the historical record, archaeologists and historians are, are still interested in the role of climate. But as I say, we're slightly insulated by the role of climate. For example, there was a paper a few years ago which the uh, spread of um, Genghis Khan and the uh, Mongol invasion across into Western Asia and, and even into Europe um, appears to have corresponded with a period of time of quite arid conditions 
in the Mongolian steppe, which is a, a dryland environment. And some archaeologists have proposed the idea that actually in that region, arid conditions, less grazing, less pasture, all of a sudden to be able to survive, you have to expand. And that kicks off the movement of those species. Now, as I say, because you're dealing with a time when people have social networks, isolating a climatic cause is often quite difficult. So the things I would say is, yes, those barriers still exist, but whether the separation of civilization can be explained purely by a climatic factor or whether other factors are in play is actually quite difficult to prove. There, it's a really interesting question. It it kind of reminds me. I know I know I'm taking us well out of the the realms of quaternary geoscience here, but you know there are movies such as The Day After Tomorrow, which I'm sure you've seen. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you've seen it. Where of course we have a, we have a very dramatic climate event produced for uh, you know for this for the fiction, um, and suddenly North you know North America becomes uh, you know covered in ice, which of course does have this incredible effect to push population south, and of course the the Mexicans take great pleasure in refusing access to to this uh, incoming American population. I mean that's clearly a work of fiction, but 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 climate is going to be a big driver potentially for climate for human migration in the future. So it may not it, it may be a barrier, but it also might be an accelerant to movement as we saw fantastically represented in that movie. Yeah, I mean I think with the day after tomorrow so for those who aren't familiar with the film because I used to reference the uh, the film in my first year lectures quite a lot because I got very excited but a climate change physical geography concept was the basis for a Hollywood movie. And then all of a sudden I realized that I was standing up saying, oh, you all know the day after tomorrow. And it was released like 15 years ago. So it's not, it's not today, but it's an idea this kind of moving slightly away from drylands, but the idea that um, actually a lot of the warmth that we get in the North Atlantic is dependent on ocean circulation, bringing heat into the North Atlantic and the idea that melting ice, could switch off that that current and switch off the heat we're getting there and we could plunge into a new ice age. Now, it's not fanciful in the fact that we know that's happened in the past. It happened at the end of the last ice age um, when the North American ice sheet was melting and it suddenly diverted meltwater into the North Atlantic. In areas like Britain, our climate is warming out of the last ice age. The ocean circulation switches off, we suddenly plunge back into an ice age and then once all that fresh water has gone, the ocean cir circulation reestablishes itself and we warm again. The point is, is that that happens over hundreds, if not thousands of years, which is which is which doesn't make for a blockbuster film. You know, <laughs> you didn't but the point you make about climate migration actually getting back to drylands is crucial because effectively, you know, when we talk about the percentage of the Earth's population who live in drylands, like 35% of the Earth, of the Earth's population are living under dryland conditions. Most of those aren't living in the hyper-arid arid region. Most of those are living in the semi-arid, dry subhumid regions, the wetter parts where you can sustain vegetation, you can sustain agriculture. But of course, what happens under most climate models in the future, well, as we've said, the the desert regions expand. So, you know, you end up in a situation where semi-arid, dry, subhumid Mediterranean suddenly becomes semi-arid to arid. And all of a sudden you have a population there, which at the moment is completely viable. But in the future, when you've got limited water resources and when you actually have warmer conditions and more of that available water just gets evaporated again, all of a sudden you can't sustain that population. And climate migrations, I think as the 21st century progresses, is, is, is likely to be a major thing. I mean, it's already happening. Um, but if you think about what the, the idea that drylands are supposed to expand, the people who are living on the desert fringes are suddenly gonna find that water resources, water stresses become a major issue and that's what causes migration. And actually, I think that answer, and by the way, can I just let you know, Ian, because you can't see the chat. Uh, I think we judged our audience perfectly. Sam, uh, who, was, who asked the question, has said, thanks a lot. Great insight. Very interesting point about Genghis Khan. Question well answered. And also, day after tomorrow is top notch. So at least we had, we had, we had one viewer. 
thank you. Thanks, Sam. That's that's brilliant. I'm glad that that question was answered. But actually, in answering that question, Ian, I think you've you've kind of started also to anticipate the next question I have here as well, which asks specifically um, about uh, increasing aridification in the Mediterranean in the future as being a major impact of global warming. Uh, so what are the main impacts of this for society? And I suspect that some of the things you've just been talking about in terms of water stress might be indeed one of those big impacts. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I, the Mediterranean is quite often a, an example when people talk about regions which are really vulnerable to future climate change. So if we go back to our, our friend, the trusty globe here, whoops, where are we? That's America. There we go. So here we are, North Africa. So the Mediterranean we've got here. And the crucial thing is you've got arid, hyper-arid Sahara here. And then to the north, you've got humid, sub-humid Europe. So you're on a boundary. And effectively, you only need small changes in climate regime when you're on a boundary to shift a region into a different climatic state. And actually, um, people who are interested in climate change in the past, the Mediterranean has always been an area of interest because you see the impact of past climate changes in the Mediterranean much more clearly than you do in, say, Britain, which is in a you know, particular climatic setting. So most of the models are suggesting that the Mediterranean um, will get drier in the future. And I mean, I, I showed in my, in my lecture last week, one of the last slides I showed was climate predictions for um, the world in terms of precipitation. And effectively, you could see over the Mediterranean that the climate, the predictions of rainfall were declining uh, rainfall in both winter and summer. And also, I, I mentioned one of the things I talked about last week was the um, problems of the reliability of predictions. Re predicting future rainfall is really difficult. You know, it's much more difficult than temperature. And in many areas, the model predictions don't agree, but in the Mediterranean, they really do. So effectively, the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as well as talking about the scientific evidence for climate change and also the predictions and the projections about what might happen in the future, the other thing they do is talk about societal impacts. And effectively, most of the things that you see in the Mediterranean are primarily about water resources. We talk about global warming, but in many regions of the world, it's actually global drying, which is going to be the major impact. So, so in the Mediterranean, you might have, um, you know, things are simply um, drinking water and irrigation. So any of you who have been to on holiday to southern Spain will know lots of southern Spain, these huge plasticas, the greenhouses, where effectively they grow fruit and salad crops that are then cash crops, which are sent to Northern Europe. Now, those all require irrigation. You know, they're, they're great for southern Spain because, you know, they're, they're warm climate, you know, in warm climates, they will grow quicker, but they need irrigation. Now, even if climate wasn't changing, most of our industry is not sustainable because the uh, farmers are, are taking more water from the aquifer, the groundwater table, than is being replaced by rainfall. So in southern Spain, the water tables are dropping like that, and that's without any climate change. So those industries aren't sustainable at the present day. Um, and that goes into things like tourism, and it goes into things like hydroelectric power. So all of those industries, and remember lots of the Mediterranean, the, the tourist industry is a huge thing, suddenly stop, to, stop being sustainable. And that's particularly true when you think also that the temperature will be, be higher and, and be, be less tolerable. So the combination of water resource availability plus the high temperatures suddenly makes the Mediterranean less hospitable as a place to live. And that's kind of the IPC suggestion is that what you're going to see over the 21st century is migration northwards as people move to higher parts of Europe. Because the contrast is actually most climate models suggest northern Europe will get wetter and will get much more rainfall. So that's interesting. So southern Europe, part southern Spain, where we take our first year students every year, that area is going to get drier and drier. It already is getting drier and drier. So, but if we go what, up through France, up to the UK, then we see some kind of pivot uh, there somewhere. And, and Britain, what might actually become wetter 
as a result of climate change or because I think one of the things that many people feel is that Britain at, at the moment is becoming drier, that our summers yeah. seem hotter and drier. So uh, what is there a tipping point that will come? So, so the interesting thing about Britain um, and, you know, you might think we're not talking about drylands, but actually um, one of the things that we might think of is, is, is what will, will Britain become a dryland in the future? Is just this idea that if you look at model projections for annual rainfall in Britain, annual rainfall doesn't change in Britain. But what happens is winters are predicted to become wetter and summers are predicted to become drier, okay? So if you look, if, if you looked at a climate model output and said, how much is mean annual rainfall in Britain gonna change? The possibility is that the amount of rainfall we get in the year isn't gonna change, but our winters are gonna become wetter and our summers are gonna become drier. And because our climate is gonna become drier, actually our climate is gonna be much more affected by evaporation and during the summer, during those hot summers, you're gonna lose more evaporation. So it's interesting, you know, you kind of traditionally in the old physical geography from the text, textbooks going back into the 1950s, they would always talk about the area of the Breckland, which is part of Norfolk and Suffolk, being the closest Britain comes to a desert. And of course it's not a desert, but, but it does have the lowest rainfall because, you know, just as we said with other dryland areas, there's a rain shadow effect as, moisture moves off the Atlantic, most of the rainfall falls on the West Coast. That's why Wales and the Pennines and Manchester are uh, historically areas of high rainfall. As you move across, you lose that rainfall and the Western area is drier. Um, now, if you think, you know, because in terms of mean annual rainfall, parts of Eastern England get similar kind of level of rainfall to Southern Spain. It's just throughout the year at the present day. What climate change is gonna do is make the winters wetter the sun is drier, and that automatically starts to produce, make water resource management an issue for Britain. Now, I don't know whether technically Britain would come into one of those dryland categories, whether we've become dry subhumid in Eastern England, but certainly water resource management is gonna become an issue for Britain, even though our actual mean annual rainfall might not change. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point. And I guess it's also the scale that you think about the United Kingdom on. So par parts of the UK might very well I think you're suggesting become drylands according to some uh, designations, but that doesn't necessarily apply to the Northwest Highlands of Scotland. Wait, wait, no, no, you so, so, so you, you will have an interesting kind of water inequality because Scotland being further north is, is actually produced, produced to get wetter all year round. It's southern and central England, which is supposed to have this strong seasonality because one of the things, and we mentioned this in relative to the, re relation to the ice ages, um, the warmer the air is, the more moisture it can hold. Mm. So one of the reasons that Northern Europe is going to get wetter is because actually what's going to happen is the cold climates of the winter, actually the air will become moisture, wet warmer, you'll be able to hold more moisture and so you get more rainfall. And that's why if you look at most climate predictions, you get this incredible imbalance between Northern and Southern Europe. Northern Europe, the rainfall is going to increase hugely and in southern Europe, it's going to get drier and drier. So you get this really strong contrast between what's going on in the two regions. And again, that fuels into this idea of climate force migration, that dryland areas becoming drier can't sustain the population, but northern areas can do, you know. Um, there's always been this, you know, discussion in the literature about um, if you have areas which have a wetter climate, that coupled with higher CO2 in the atmosphere, you could actually see increases in agricultural production. Um, that might be true, but the areas that's gonna be true for are gonna be limited, but if they are gonna be anywhere, it's probably gonna be in Northern Europe. So that contrast between the two regions fuels that difference in sustainability or livability yeah. between the North and the South of Europe. Ian, that's really interesting. As you, as you know, Ian, I work on this topic of no man's land. And so I was working in the, the area uh, around the trenches of the First World War uh, last year. And I was talking to the 
um, to the agriculturalists and the the nature workers who administer the, the national parks in that area. And they were telling me that they're having to relocate trees or plant tree species that were traditionally southern French Mediterranean tree, tree species. And they're now planting them in uh, effectively the area of the trenches of the First World War. So in, nor in northeast France, because climate change has changed local climate to such an extent that they want there to be sustainable forests there in the future, but the species that have traditionally grown there are no longer thriving. So they're now planting southern, southern European, Mediterranean tree species in that, in that area. So that you, you can already see examples of, of organisations yeah. having to change their planting practices. And, you know, one of the interesting things is, you know, you, you, you think about traditionally what's a natural British woodland. Well, you think about oak woodland, that's your kind of... And, but most British deciduous trees don't survive through regular sustained droughts. Right. OK. One of the things about British, British climates is throughout most of the year, you're getting enough rainfall to, to sustain plants. So plants which live under water stress, you know, that's, that's not species which thrive in Britain, but actually that's exactly what the future of Britain might be, this period of time in the middle of the year where you get much lower rainfall, more evaporation, exactly the same point. Mm. Will our traditional British tree species be able to survive? When we're thinking about crops, when we're thinking about vegetation, then we're thinking about things which are must be drought tolerant. That, that's probably the future. And it kind of comes down to even even more local, you know, I mean, I'm sure we could think of loads of things, but mm. something which might seem quite uh, small scale for some, but areas which are built on clay, okay, so any areas and lots of around the Thames Basin yeah. where we're based, lots of houses are built on clay, well, clay absorbs a lot of water. If you start getting drier and drier summers, the clay dries out, it shrinks, and you start to get subsidence, you know? And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a, a few years ago, the British Geological Survey did quite a lot of work on trying to predict the impact of climate change produced subsidence in Britain on housing and infrastructure. Because, you know, you go into somewhere like the London Basin, all of London is almost all built on below the, the sufficient sand and gravel of the River Thames, you've got clays. All of that potentially is at risk from subsidence. So, yeah, as soon as you start, to and it's in is that kind of in some ways the real harshness of climate change is when you are shifting a region into a climatic setting that it's not previously been adapted to you know and that's yeah. what happens in these regions like the mediterranean or britain or really all over the world you have a way of life you have an ecosystem you have a lifestyle which is adapted to a certain set of conditions and what you're doing is you're changing the baseline conditions. And in terms of sustainability, how adaptable is what you're doing in the present day to those new conditions? Ian, your message is clear. Sell your houses in London and buy in Stornoway. And, yes, do, and, exactly. do, and do have it you, quick. Have you, got, have you got land in Stornoway? <laughs> <laughs> this is an elaborate property prospecting call okay. here. Um, Ian, we've talked a lot about the contemporary period, and I think just to finish off, I, I, I wondered if I could take you back into the past, because again, we have maybe our final question of the day, uh, and that is, what evidence is there for more extensive drylands in the past? And I think that opens up a question for me about wh when you're doing your research in rooms like the, the one behind you, what are you looking for that tells us a story about um, you know, the arid world in the past? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, there's there's lots of lines of, of evidence for that. Um, and, you know, when we talk about sort of ice age worlds and, and deserts being more expanded than previously, you think about what you do is you, you kind of always look for a modern analogue. And what we mean by modern analogue is an example of what goes on in a desert now. And if I'm looking in the past, does what I find confirm or conform to what I see in the modern? And really good example, you know, an idea of like desertification in the past is if any of you have ever been to Mallorca, the island of Mallorca, Mallorca is kind of, it's almost like, it's a, it's a, bit, a little bit like a square. You've got a northern mountain range, you've got a southern mountain range, and in between the two, you've got this low-lying area. All of that low-lying area is fossilised sand dunes. All of that area 
is effectively the kind of sand dunes that you would currently see in North Africa. Okay, and so you can look at them, you can look at satellite images, you can see the form, you can see, you know, those typical Barkan dunes that we normally think of, the curved front, mm. the long, slow, sloping back, satellite images, you can see them. And you go to quarries, actually, on an area like New Yorker, most of the rock that they use for, recons for building cathedrals and stuff like that historically is cut up chunks of fossilised desert and you can go to the quarries and you can see the form so effectively what you're looking for when you're looking the part looking at the past is you you look at the sediments or you might look at the fossils you look to see what's present and then you go well okay where in the world at the present day do i find these processes and that's effectively how we reconstruct the past so the example i gave last week is is in parts of the amazon rainforest Below, below the vegetation, you have fossilized sand dunes. You know? And so right. effectively, it's kind of like, well, here's this densely vegetated landscape. And um, uh, beneath it, you've got evidence for the mobilization of uh, sand by wind processes. And that as a process is automatically associated with dry conditions, because if you get vegetation, the sand becomes stabilized, it doesn't move, and if it's wet, the grains become cohesive, they stick together, and they can't be moved by the wind. And that's a kind of like the sediment or landform evidence. But the ecological evidence is, you know, really quite stark. I mean, I remember working a couple of years ago in the Arabian Desert, and, you know, you, you can, because in somewhere like Britain, our fossil record is hidden under trees and woods and soils, but in a, you go to a desert and it's basically the wind has eroded large amounts of the sediment and what gets concentrated at the surface is the stuff which is too big to be blown away by the wind and that's bones and that's teeth and that's stone tools. And so quite often you can walk across this landscape and you can find all of its remains. And you know, you someone picked up something and, and it's like, oh, what's that? And it's like, oh, it's a bit of crocodile. And you're kind of in this, you're in this hyper arid landscape you cannot see any water for, you know, tens, possibly hundreds of miles. And someone's picked up a bit of crocodile and someone's picked up a bit of hippopotamus. I mean, those are quite extreme examples, but, but the fossil evidence is, is, is also, you know, pretty compelling. Um, and then you have to think to yourself, okay, well, you know, what would I need to do? What would need to happen for the region to become wet enough for those animals to live in that area. So, you know, the, the, the evidence is, is quite, you know, impressive, but you can even, you know, when we, in the last ice age, Southern Britain was probably a polar desert, you know, it was so cold and it was so arid. I mean, I've talked mostly in my talk about warm deserts. Uh, I didn't really talk about cold deserts, but of course the driest place on earth is in Antarctica because the air is so cold, it just can't hold any moisture. And Britain would have been a, like a polar desert 20,000 years ago and you go um, if you go sort of uh, on the Kent coast if you go on the channel coast of Kent mm. so just out of broad stairs you find the cliffs there are made of this very very fine grain sediment what we call a silt finer than a sand and that is basically atmospheric dust which during the last, last ice age because so much of the world was desert the concentration of dust in the atmosphere was so much dust was falling from the atmosphere, landing on the landscape and building up in these sacks. And actually, you can even go to somewhere like Britain and you can find evidence for really dry conditions because of the accumulation of this atmospheric dust, which is a, a dryland desert phenomenon. Amazing. You've taken us from the Mediterranean to Britain and back again and then down to Antarctica and with a little stop on the way at the U.S.-Mexico border, thanks. To <laughs> <laughs> you, you have the U.S.-Mexico border. I have the U.S.-Mexico border, your, your yes. Your political geography. I know. Uh, Ian, that has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. And thank you to all of those uh, who have been watching, Sam and, and Andy. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad that it will be helpful in your teaching. Please do share this with uh, with your students and with, with other teachers if you can as well. Um, the next one of these, the next Monday night lecture, the Geography for Schools lecture is going to be me talking about superpower geopolitics and that's going to be on the night of Monday the 2nd of November at five o'clock with then the question and answer and it might very well be Ian asking me the questions that night. 
on the 9th of November. So that should be after your half term, everybody. And we look forward to welcoming you then. Uh, in the meantime, please do get in touch with us, ask questions. We'd love to hear from you. And if you've got suggestions about topics that you might find really helpful for your teaching for the future, again, let us know. We'd like to, we'd like to offer uh, our academics up to you in ways that are really helpful to you. So keep in touch with us. And from Ian and from myself, thank you all very much and have a good evening. Great. Thanks very much, Al. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. See you. Bye-bye, everyone.